Okay, welcome back everybody. Today, we're continuing our RSET training, NASA Atmospheric Composition Ground Networks Supporting Air Quality and Climate Applications, with part four, Introduction to the Tropospheric Ozone LIDAR Network, or TOLNET. Today, you'll be hearing from me, Melanie Follett Cook. I am a research scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and project scientist for the RSET program. But during today's presentation, you'll mostly be hearing from Dr. John Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan is the principal investigator of the Tollnet Network and works with me here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. By the end of part four of our training series today, we hope that participants will be able to identify the basic characteristics of the Tollnet instruments used by NASA for ground-based active remote sensing of tropospheric ozone, recognize how Tollnet supports air quality and climate applications and complements satellite observations, and access relevant Tollnet data for a given location and application purpose. To recap, in the first two parts of this training, we learned about Aeronet, which is a passive remote sensing network. Aeronet provides information about aerosols in the atmosphere. Part one gave us an overview of the Aeronet network, instrumentation and data products. And in part two, we saw how to use the Aeronet website to access and visualize data. And we stepped through several Jupyter notebooks to read and map Aeronet data in several ways as well as create time series and compare Aeronet and Beer's AOD. In part three, we learned about the Pandora instrument and Pandonia Global Network. The Pandora instrument is a passive hyperspectral instrument. Whereas the Aeronet network measures aerosols, Pandora measures trace gases in the atmosphere, specifically ozone, formaldehyde, and nitrogen dioxide. During today's training, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box within WebEx at any time. At the end of today's training, we'll try to address as many of these questions as we can, and we'll post the questions and written answers to the training page within about a week after the training. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John Sullivan to give us an overview of the Tollnet Network. So thank you, Melanie, uh, for that great introduction. I am John Sullivan, based out of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and I am the Tropospheric Ozone LIDAR, or TOLNET, project scientist. Today, I'm going to give you a nice overview of TOLNET, and hopefully you walk away with a better understanding of LIDAR, of ozone in the atmosphere, and of our relevance and background motivation for uh, the network as a whole. The first question that needs to be discussed is what levels of ozone are in Earth's atmosphere? Earth's atmosphere is broken into two main sections, the stratosphere and the troposphere. Uh, these are represented here in the figure on the right as being in a blue or an orange section. We generally describe ozone from a measurement perspective as good up high, bad nearby, meaning that we want higher levels of ozone in the stratosphere to block harmful UV rays. So good up high, but bad nearby. We don't want it uh, down where we as humans breathe. It, it can be uh, an impact to public health. Because of this reason, NASA has a continued interest in understanding both stratospheric and tropospheric ozone levels. Tollnet focuses their research in the tropospheric portion of the ozone. I will describe throughout this talk some of the measurement techniques we use to observe ozone and hopefully, and hopefully get across the value of Tollnet and tropospheric ozone LIDAR. I do want to mention on the left for some context, generally the atmosphere is composed of three main species of molecules, nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, which make almost 99% of the atmosphere. However, in terms of ozone, we generally describe it as parts per million by volume in the stratosphere, so zero to about 10, and parts per billion in the troposphere, zero to 100. And just as a note, one part per million is equal to a thousand parts per billion. 
hopefully this gets you a better understanding of some of the vertical variability of ozone in Earth's atmosphere that we like to measure at NASA. It's also important to understand the common measurement techniques of ozone. Of course, NASA is focused on satellite observations, especially Earth observing satellites. You can see on the diagram here, CubeSats, International Space Station sensors, low Earth orbit satellites, and geostationary satellites all have some form of ozone measurements. Generally, these are a total column ozone measurement, so from below the satellite to the surface, or partial columns mainly in the stratosphere with that larger stratospheric abundance. Current satellites have a real challenge in measuring tropospheric ozone, however, just due to the much smaller portion, as I mentioned, that part per billion versus part per million concentration or mixing ratio of ozone. NASA also has a long history of using aircraft observations to measure ozone, uh, traditionally during field experiments. However, this can be costly and quite time consuming to have as a normal routine observing platform. Another way NASA has measured ozone is using balloon-borne measurements, uh, also known as ozone sondes. And this is a, a really great way, an accurate way to measure ozone, has been used by NASA for almost 50 years. These can complement Tollnet measurements quite well, um, but the single balloon profile of ozone cannot always tell the story as continuously as LIDARs. In situ monitoring or surface trace gas analyzers are very common for ozone throughout work, generally with the air quality community or with the environmental justice community. Paired with Tollnet data, I'll hopefully show you throughout this talk how we can help better explain the vertical and horizontal transport of ozone in a three-dimensional perspective. Now that I've hopefully established the need for Tollnet and the profiling of ozone with the broader motivation um, and relevance to NASA, I'd like to introduce Tollnet a little bit more formally and over the next few slides, describe the differential absorption LIDAR technique or dial technique. Tollnet was established in 2012 with five charter instruments. Uh, and this, these instrument teams have grown to eight operating 12 LIDAR instruments. These are all currently located in North America. These are generally lab or trailer-based transportable LIDAR systems, uh, but I will show you some recent advancements um, and some technology development with smaller portable ozone LIDARs that have been developed for community use in recent years. In addition to the instrument teams, we have an internal Tollnet forecast and modeling team at NASA Ames, and our website and long-term data storage is handled at NASA Langley's Atmospheric Science Data Center, or ASDC. As a prerequisite for this course, you should have already registered for an Earth Data account, which is handled through the ASDC. So you have already taken the first steps to access and begin to visualize Tollnet data. So I'm hoping here today to uh, make sure everyone here has a better understanding of the major components of LIDAR systems. So LIDAR or light detection and ranging can be very complicated. We won't have time to go into all of the engineering details, but what I do want to make sure you leave here today with is a good working understanding of the major LIDAR components. And in particular, how powerful LIDAR can be at helping to understand our earth system. On the left, this simple illustration highlights the three main components of any LIDAR system, whether that be a laboratory-based system, a space-borne LIDAR system, or a LIDAR that can fit in the size of the palm of your hand. LIDAR consists primarily of a laser source, a telescope or receiver, and a data acquisition system. For atmospheric LIDAR applications, this laser is transmitted into the atmosphere, the laser light is then scattered off of anything in the atmosphere, including other molecules, trace gases, and aerosols or particulates. A large portion of that light is directly backscattered, so think of the atmosphere as acting like a mirror, back to a telescope. The size and optical parameters of this telescope will vary based on how much light you want to collect and how high into the atmosphere you may want to view. 
Finally, every LiDAR system has a data acquisition system, which will record the data coming back, generally in counts at various levels or bins in the atmosphere. The next step in understanding LiDAR and dial are determining which wavelengths or colors of light that will be used. And this is very important in atmospheric LiDAR. We want Tolnet to be able to measure in both day and night conditions, as well as be able to be absorbed by ozone. The left panel shows the electromagnetic spectrum with a zoomed in view of the ultraviolet or UV region to the infrared light region. Radiation from our sun falls off drastically below about 300 nanometers, making this an ideal region for Tolnet to operate in without having additional contamination from the sun, which we use as solar background radiation. Most Tolnet lighters operate between 266 and 300 nanometers during the day for this reason. The right image shows a simple illustration of wavelength selection for Tolnet. This, on the y-axis, we have relative ozone absorption, and on the x-axis, we have wavelength of light. This concept is referred to as differential absorption LIDAR, or dial. The differential absorption occurs based on the wavelengths of laser light used, which are referred to as on, or more absorbing, which is the blue line. And please reference the blue arrow on the EM spectrum as well. You can see that that is farther into the ultraviolet and an offline wavelength, which is less absorbing, which is indicated by the red line. The vertical dashed arrow is simply a proxy for that differential amount of absorption, or delta sigma. So between these two wavelengths, we can then accurately calculate ozone, and I'll show that uh, equation on the next slide. On the left now, we have a simple plot of the return signals that are recorded with our data acquisition system. Recall that the data acquisition was the third most important component of any LIDAR system. The y-axis on this diagram are uh, altitude above the ground at range R, and the x-axis is the return signal P. As the light is collected, we start to see a general separation in the return signals that is based on the differential absorption of ozone. Moving over to the equation now, N, which is our concentration profile of N of ozone at range R, can then be calculated simply by using the distance that that signal is collected from the laser source and the delta sigma that was defined in that previous slide relating to the fundamental ozone absorption properties at each wavelength. Of course, these simple diagrams are very smooth, but real data can have additional features from clouds or aerosols and particulates. We will see an example of real data on the next slide, but I want you to walk away with the understanding of how we select our wavelengths, how the absorption between those wavelengths matters, and how when we transmit that light into the atmosphere, we can physically understand differences in the vertical distribution of ozone based on that fundamental absorbing principle. There are many general benefits of LIDAR. With Tolnet, we understand vertical profiles of tropospheric ozone. So because this is the first curtain plot or time series we show, I wanna just walk through this slowly. And I should also mention this image was uh, directly created on our website with, with very little work and you will be um, hopefully able to generate plots like this by the end of this session or in the homework application. Your y-axis is altitude, so this is the first four kilometers of the atmosphere. The x-axis is time. Each of these horizontal stripes are representing roughly 30 minutes in time. So we're now getting every 30 minutes a profile of tropospheric ozone um, that, be, that can be continuous to better characterize ozone features. Ozone, these colors correspond to ozone in parts per billion by volume. So you can see the color bar on the top indicating 40 to 60 parts per billion in blue and green colors. As you get higher into higher levels of ozone, it becomes red to maroon to gray. This color bar was created 
partially to complement the EPA's US air quality index on the left. Now, actually looking in a little closer at the data actually plotted, we begin to see fundamental characteristics of ozone and ozone transport that are revealed only with Tollnet LiDAR. We do see some transported pollutants entering the region. We see low ozone values in the morning that are likely tied to additional chemical processes such as titration effects. We can see clouds. So there are artifacts in the data that we work closely with our uh, Tollnet teams to better screen. And then we can also see high ozone uh, in the atmosphere um, that is generally uh, in the range that it would be concerning for public health. I've shown you the general mathematics and theory behind Tollnet LIDARs, and I've showed you some of the data. I want to also give you an impression today of some of the sizes of the Tollnet instrumentation. I mentioned we were five charter instruments developed in 2012. Each of these instruments have been primarily trailer based. They are deployed for larger field network campaigns. On the left, we have the NOAA Topaz, or Tunable Optical Profiler for Aerosols and Ozone. Uh, the right, the NASA Langley Mobile Ozone LiDAR and the NASA Goddard Tropospheric Ozone LiDAR. These are all larger trailer-based systems, uh, which offer an ozone chemistry laboratory on wheels. Many times these trailers are deployed with additional surface analyzers for trace gases. Uh, ozone sons will be launched. Additional aerosol properties or other LIDARs are also generally co-located uh, with these trailer-based systems. I um, encourage anyone who's interested more in learning about some of the individual LIDAR systems to visit the website and view the publications. We also have more recently been developing a small ozone LIDAR. Uh, these compact and portable systems were developed at NASA JPL's Table Mountain facility and they offer the ability to provide ozone profiles to the community at lower cost and with less restrictive sampling locations. You can see in these three images, the small LIDAR there on the left, the general size of it uh, fitting in the back of a pickup truck. And um, generally, some of the deployment locations have been much more um, easy to access rather than having the, the strict space and power requirements of a larger trailer based system. This concludes the general introduction to Tollnet. I hope you've walked away at this point with a working understanding of the area of interest for ozone and the broader motivation for Tollnet, some of the fundamental theory underlying Tollnet, some of the understanding of LIDAR or a good working understanding of the, the value and importance of LIDAR and a better understanding of what the Tollnet data actually looks like and what the instrumentation looks like in the field. The next section of this discussion will be on Tollnet application and uses. This session will primarily describe uh, various profiles of ozone from Tollnet and how we can better connect those profiles to the larger community. The three main components that Tollnet was chartered to do are listed here on the left. To observe high resolution planetary boundary layer ozone, and I will show some examples in the following slides, to be used to better evaluate air quality forecast and chemical transport models, and to study the atmospheric structure for evaluation of current and future satellites. On the right is an animation of the Tempo satellite, and this is the tropospheric NO2 product that has been recently um, provided to the community. Uh, we hope in future years, the Tempo team is able to produce a tropospheric ozone product that we expect Tollnet to be able to evaluate um, and validate. A large component of Tollnet historically has been to deploying these ozone LIDARs for field work. The table on the left shows uh, a list of all of these deployment locations and uh, various sites across the U.S. that have had Tollnet participation. I encourage you, if you are located in one of these regions or were a part of one of these field campaigns, to reach out to some of the members of Tollnet to better understand how you might be able to connect with the data. 
I've already shown this slide, the general benefits of Tollnet LiDAR, but I wanted to just highlight it again now in the context of a simple case study. These measurements were collected in summer of 2023 and July of 2023 uh, in the Long Island Sound region. Uh, this LiDAR in particular was deployed to a site that was near the Long Island Sound. Now that you have a better working understanding of Tollnet data, it's time to better understand how these LiDARs can be used in more of a case study example to understand regional chemical transport. In summer of 2023, we had four Tollnet LiDARs in the New York City region. These were located in the Long Island Sound area, in downtown Manhattan, Westport, Connecticut, and in Madison, Connecticut. I'm showing the data from Oldfield, New York here, which is a site very near the Long Island Sound, where you are seeing some higher elevated levels of ozone uh, throughout the day that are corresponding to ozone that is of exceedance levels. However, the value in Tollnet is understanding that chemical transport between sites. The slide here has LIDAR profiles from Manhattan, New York, the same profiles in the previous slide from Oldfield, New York, as well as Madison, Connecticut. The EPA map here on the, on the bottom right showing generally the surface values of ozone and how those compare to the vertical profiles of LIDAR. Each of these plots are shown on the same vertical and temporal axes. So this really gives you a great understanding of how these LIDARs can be used to better understand pollution coming into the region. Each site is showing a slightly different level of pollution aloft, as well as a slightly different level of pollution being built up um, in the planetary boundary layer on this day. You also can look at each of these profiles or each of these LIDAR sites and understand some general chemical transport, depending on the timing of some of these features occurring at each site. I also wanted to take a moment to connect back the Tollnet data to a previous portion of this RSET training with the Aeronet data. So trying to use multiple ground-based networks to better characterize pollution events so that somebody who is really interested in, in pollution in a local environment can use both of these instrumentation to better understand some of the complexities. On the left, we have the Aeronet aerosol optical depth on the same day that we have on the right from the Tollnet boundary layer ozone. Combining these two net ground-based net NASA networks, we can begin to understand chemical transport patterns, as well as see that on this day, there was an increase in aerosol burden as well as in ozone burden. Things like this then can be used to better understand some of the various differences in trace gas transport and aerosol transport, both of which are concerns for public health. Another example of a Tollnet LIDAR deployment campaign occurred this in summer of 2023. This was with, in the California area, we had the Table Mountain Tropospheric Ozone LIDAR or TM TALL as well as two of these smaller portable ozone lighters that I described in a previous slide, one in Pasadena and one in San Bernardino. The curtains here on the left then show the small one, small two, and TM tall data. Firstly, I want to show the general performance of these smaller lidars is quite impressive as compared to the heritage measurements made at Table Mountain. Second, I want to comment on the critical understanding of ozone transport in this region and how we really are seeing that buildup of additional ozone in the San Bernardino site as compared to the Pasadena site. The strong ozone diurnal cycle is likely due to morning titration and then afternoon ozone buildup. There are many sites in the Los Angeles area that are continually achieving high ozone. Um, Tollnet is certainly aiding in understanding where this ozone is coming from, its production, and how it may be recirculated to other sites in the region. 
So now that you've seen some great examples of Tolnet data, I hope that we can begin to um, provide some simple steps in the next few slides on how to access the Tolnet data, uh, show you how to visualize this data on the website very easily with a few clicks, and also to understand where some Python toolboxes may be available for those of you who are interested in that. So accessing Tollnet data, um, the website, and if you're looking at the screen, the QR code is there on the bottom left. Um, this was a big initiative in Tollnet in 2024 <clears throat> to roll out uh, this website, which allows for easier data discovery and data management for end users, the ability to graph in real time and uh, view data, historical data, um, an API for automation, feature interface and interoperability, and a more functional search feature uh, for data subsetting. The right there is just when you go to the site, this is the main data download site. We also, based on feedback from the community, developed a calendar view. So you can very quickly go to the data calendar, uh, select the LIDAR of interest, um, what type of data you're looking for, and a calendar view will then populate based on that query. Um, this is also a great way to visualize a lot of the Tollnet data, um, depending on where you are or, or what um, region you are in interest. By clicking on any of those calendar blocks on the previous slide, uh, an in-browser graph will pop up. And this has a um, the plotted Tollnet data for that day. You can then go in uh, as an end user and modify the X and Y axes and the limits. And there are also some additional capabilities um, for those that might have trouble viewing the color bar um, as well. Another way to access the Tollnet data is to use the Tollnet toolbox, which is a Python notebook that has recently been developed at NASA Goddard. Um, this can be accessed by going to the ASDC data and user services GitHub. The link is on the screen. And then by opening the Tollnet API examples notebook. Uh, this can be viewed in either the native browser or downloaded to use in other environments such as uh, Anaconda or Jupyter. So simply walking through the similar case study that we wanted to look at earlier, um, all of those graphics were uh, individually distributed on the website. However, with uh, this Python notebook, if you're interested in looking at a certain site, I mentioned FlaxPond on one of the earlier sites, and you wanted to pull data from that, uh, Tollnet data from that location, but you also wanted to look at all of the other LIDARs very easily. Uh, with a simple API call, you're able to do that. So an, another example case study, similar to the case study that was described in the New York region, if we look at July 12, 2023, and we want to graph the Tollnet data using the API to graph uh, the Goddard LiDAR during this time, uh, we can import it with Python with a simple call. Uh, if we only want the data from the Goddard LiDAR on June 12th, we can then filter accordingly with specific start and end dates and an instrument ID. This will then quickly generate a profile plot here and with that can then be uh, either saved locally or augmented as needed for your application. The advancement with the Tollnet toolbox uh, really is in the ability to pull multiple LIDARs at one time with one query. So instead of just looking at one LIDAR at one time, which has historically been the approach for the uh, Tollnet website, we now have the ability to enter in uh, start and end date um, and a product ID that is all documented in the, in the Python notebook. And it will pull any available data during that time. And what you have plotted here are uh, six different uh, Tollnet LIDARs or at least six different processing types that are then in the archive. So anyone looking for a general uh, model evaluation or satellite evaluation with Tollnet data can very quickly pull data regardless of the location of that LIDAR.
There's also some description in the Tollnet toolbox of the Tollnet curtains in terms of data formatting, of access labels, um, of crop graphs, and various sample X and Y labels, and how to save the figure uh, to the respective directory that you need for your use. The final component of the Tollnet toolbox that I think is important for the community to visualize is comparing the Tollnet data with uh, existing ozone forecasts or uh, meteorological models. We have done this with the NASA GOCF Global Atmospheric Composition Model, which produces an ozone forecast and a replay. So with very simple queries, you're able to not just plot the Tollnet data, but then send an analogous set of API calls to the uh, GOCF team. And uh, that data then is returned. And you can generate simple plots here, like on the right, where you have now uh, 15 days of ozone LIDAR data on the top and the analogous set of ozone profiles from that same uh, latitude and longitude or the, the, the closest grid point. Uh, plotted for that same time. So you can begin to better understand visual differences in the LIDAR and model. Uh, this is actually quite impressive, uh, quite an impressive feat, both from the LIDAR perspective and the modeling perspective to see these two matching as, as well as they do. Um, in the future, we do hope to build out tools that might provide better statistics um, or evaluation of some of these forecasts in line. Um, but at this point, it is simply uh, just a visual identification between the two. So in summary, if you are on the website or would like to get to the website, you can discover the data, uh, you can make near real time graphs. Uh, there's other capabilities in terms of, of viewing individual days of ozone LIDAR data. Um, if you wanna use the API for any automation efforts um, or inter any interoperability, that is the place to go. Um, and there are some really functional search features that we've added um, in the last few years. If you are interested in uh, looking at more than one LIDAR, um, so multiple LIDARs to be able to be graphed quickly, um, the comparison to the GOCF or maybe some other future air quality, uh, air composition models might be of interest to you, we really recommend uh, considering the Tollnet toolbox on the ASDC GitHub um, for that. And hopefully these both will be continued to be uh, supported in the near future. And if there are any suggestions uh, on tools that you want to see, please feel free to reach out to myself or, or put that in the chat and I can document that for, for now. Uh, finally, I want to wrap up today with just acknowledging some of the major components here for Tollnet. Um, the image on the left is from our seventh annual Tollnet Science Team meeting, which occurred in Silver Spring, Maryland in 2019. Um, but we have had continued funding from the NASA Headquarters Tropospheric Composition Program. Uh, we've had a lot of Tollnet scientists and station leads who have been here from the beginning that have been really critical in uh, the growth and success of Tollnet. I want to give a specific shout out to Michael Newchurch from the University of Alabama Huntsville, who is our Tollnet chief scientist and has done uh, a tremendous effort at highlighting the utility and value of Tollnet LiDAR. Um, and finally, the NASA ASDC and data team for really providing uh, the ability to uh, update our website um, and to just be a storage unit for um, all the Tollnet data that we hope the end users can go and download and, and play around with and, and use for their uh, end use. So thank you for that. So we've now come to the summary section of the Tollnet description. And I want to just make sure that everyone here was able to really understand a little bit more about Tollnet. Um, we discussed the basic characteristics of ozone in the atmosphere and the available measurement techniques. Hopefully you learned uh, the various pros and cons of some of these measurement techniques. We introduced the differential absorption LIDAR technique used for Tollnet, but also with other trace gas LIDARs. Hopefully you have a better understanding of the wavelength selection, um, and the differential absorption of, e of these wavelengths. We introduced a few of the major hardware components and various sizes of Tollnet LIDARs. Um, hopefully you're able to recognize now how Tollnet supports air quality. Uh, we did describe a case study where Tollnet LIDARs were able to characterize high ozone in New York, as well as in California. And then we did a simple walkthrough of accessing relevant Tollnet data for a given location and application purpose by using the website and the Tollnet 
uh, Python notebook. So my time is up here today, um, but thank you for um, sticking around, listening to this Tollnet description, and please don't hesitate to, to reach out if there's any questions or comments on how you could use Tollnet data or access it. I want to make sure that everyone here um, can, can use the data if they need it. So um, I'll wrap up here and pass it back to Melanie. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. That was a fantastic overview of the Tollnet LiDAR network. Tollnet is the first of two ground-based networks that we'll review that use active remote sensing. Tollnet LiDARs use differential absorption LiDAR or dial technique to calculate vertical profiles of ozone mixing ratio. These vertical profiles are an important complement to satellite-based passive sensors like TEMPO and TROPOMI that measure troposphere columns and ground-based passive sensors like Pandora that measure total column and lower tropospheric profiles. LiDAR profiles can help create a more three-dimensional picture of pollutant transport and connect the information from passive sensors to surface in situ concentrations. We saw some examples of this in the case studies presented by Dr. Sullivan. Part five will be the final session in this training series, and we will learn about the second ground-based network using active remote sensing, the Micropulse LiDAR Network, or MPLNet. While Tollnet uses active remote sensing to measure ozone profiles, as we saw today, MPLNet observes profiles of aerosols and clouds. Again, a reminder that this training series has one homework assignment, You'll be able to access the homework from the training webpage starting August 22nd, and all answers should be submitted using Google Forms by September 5th. Certificates of completion will be issued to participants who attend all five of the live trainings and submit the homework before that deadline. And certificates are typically issued by email about two months after the training. This is an additional information slide with our contact information, um, with emails for myself and Dr. Sullivan, as well as links to the RSET website, YouTube channel, and Twitter or X, as well as our sister programs, Develop and Servier. And last but not least, we've added some Tollnet resources to our resources slide here. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will now transition over to the Q&A portion of today's training. And before we begin, um, we have, in addition to Dr. Sullivan, we have an additional expert on hand. John, would you like to unmute and introduce uh, Fernando? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay, Melanie? Yep, very great. Okay, great. Um, so the, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Fernando Chalza from NASA JPL Table Mountain Facility. Um, all of the great slides you saw on the small ozone LIDAR, um, which I saw some great questions in the chat about that. So I know a lot of you were also um, pretty motivated and excited about that. Um, Fernando is really the, um, the lead engineer on that project and all around Tolnet uh, scientist and, and guru. So I wanted to bring Fernando in to also answer some additional questions and, and technical questions. So um, I don't know, Fernando, if you wanted to, to say hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, we're going to do our best to answer them as, as uh, good as possible. Great. Um, happy to have you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we'll make our way through the questions. I'll read them out. And then um, you both can speak to uh, the answers. So question one, do ozone measurements with balloons allow to detect only the vertical distribution or can you monitor, can you use them to also detect the horizontal distribution? Uh, so yeah, so potentially you can use it, right? But the balloon only measures uh, along the trajectory of the balloon. So um, it's quite limited what you can extract out of the balloon measurement regarding horizontal variability. You can certainly combine the balloon uh, measurement with um, other techniques like satellites, LIDAR, stuff like that to 
get a better idea of what you're measuring with the balloon. But yeah, so you have a measurement along the trajectory. What you do with it will depend on the specific application, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, question two. What is the basic concept of LIDAR? And we covered this in the training, but maybe we can just give a, a summary here. Yeah, sure. So I think this is an important point and uh, I'll give a plug for the Micropulse LiDAR network uh, training on Thursday, which uses uh, another uh, version of LiDAR, and a, a, the, the green aerosol LiDAR. Um, so LiDAR or light detection and ranging, you might see it as, as an acronym spelled with one way or another way. Um, effectively, we are transmitting uh, a laser pulse out of a, a laser, it's it's firing uh, quite rapidly. In our case, 100 hertz or uh, upwards of a kilohertz with, with some of the Twilnet sites. That light is being transmitted uh, in the atmosphere. That light interacts with the atmosphere and reflects back down uh, and, and we collect it. So uh, LIDAR and other um, forms can be used for altimetry, um, can be used for ranging. There's there's LIDAR technology uh, in a lot of other areas. Um, really, Tolnet is focused on atmospheric uh, LIDAR. Um, and basically, we use that return signal um, to then retrieve physical quantities of the atmosphere, in our case, uh, ozone. And then, like I said, on Thursday, um, uh, optical properties of aerosol is, is what the NPL net is uh, focused on. Great. Question three seems to ask a lot of details about uh, some asp aspects of LIDAR measurements. So what is the frequency and accuracy? How deep can LIDAR detect? Uh, does it work at night without GPS or underwater? <laughs> so lots of pieces to this question. Uh, okay, so I can take this one. Uh, so regarding frequency, I assume the question is uh, about the wavelengths that we use because we also use a pulse laser generally. So you can also talk about what is the repetition rate of the laser, but I think that's less relevant. Uh, <clears throat> so regarding the wavelengths that we use for LiDAR, in the case of ozone LiDARs, we use uh, um, UV uh, lasers uh, because we we rely on the absorption by ozone uh, of a UV radiation to make our measurement, right? So we have to uh, pick two wavelengths, one that's more absorbed, one that's less absorbed. And so looking at how much gets absorbed one versus the other, we can calculate the, the, um, the amount. Uh, regarding accuracy, it's uh, really dependent on um, many variables, basically uh, our vertical resolution, our time resolution, how much we average over time, uh, what with which wavelengths we pick, how much uh, solar background we have, right? Uh, generally at night, we have a better accuracy than during the day. In the case of uh, tropospheric uh, ozone lighters, that's not that important, but it's still uh, affected by, by um, a solar uh, light. Uh, lighters definitely work at night uh, because we have to carry our own light source. Uh, that's uh, an advantage, let's say, over passive instruments that rely on the sun to make the measurement. Uh, lighters do not need a uh, GPS, and we uh, also lighters do not work underwater. Uh, but there are lighters, you know, the ones that are used for uh, measuring the um, uh, underwater, uh, generally operate in the green uh, region of the spectrum. Uh, but yeah, the uh, also lighters do not um, operate underwater. So yeah, I think that's. Yeah, covers more, most of it. Thank you. Question four, the measurements reached four kilometers as in as shown in the figure. So this is, I think, referring to four kilometers altitude. Um, can it reach higher altitudes? So it's an important concept to understand that um, the atmosphere itself in, in some ways limits our altitude detection. So, um, it, of course, relies on how um, powerful our laser is. Um, solar background, although we're operating most of these Tolnet LIDARs below the uh, solar curve, so below about 300 nanometers, uh, we still get some solar background contamination in our signal just due to imperfect um, inter uh, narrow band interference filters um, or averaging of the data. So if you really wanted uh, Tolnet data that could potentially go higher in the atmosphere, um, generally 
in clear skies, so clouds or ozone are not um, absorbing your signal, um, and you've got low um, low solar background. So um, ultimately, the altitude coverage is um, dependent on your your physical uh, parameters, such as um, like I said, the, the laser, but also the atmosphere itself is is kind of um, helping you uh, absorb some of that that signal. So it's a it's a combination of of both, um, and I will just comment that um, one of the sort of, you know, what I think important parts about ozone LIDAR or, or LIDAR in general is uh, we're able to average longer um, to potentially get higher in the atmosphere. So there's also some additional software um, either averaging or uh, in, improving your um, or degrading your vertical resolution to improve potentially your, your altitude coverage. So um, there's lots of little uh, things that we've done throughout the years to try to provide um, the best data to the community and we've sort of come down to uh, a compromise in um, about a 10 minute m most of the data you'll see um, for the curtain plots that is which is what was sh was shown um, throughout this presentation are generally in the 10 to 15 minute uh, temporal range which seems to be a nice coverage so sub hourly profiles you know four to five profiles per hour for for the community um, but getting the data out that um, with that level of temporal resolution does reduce our our upper limits um, in some respects. So, um, but yeah, there's a certain case that anyone is working on and they desperately want to use that data at a higher altitude. Um, please reach out to uh, myself or um, anyone on the team and we can try to see if there's a way to potentially recover some of that. Um, some of that altitude. Thanks. Question five, how to join the Tollnet network? Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, mention that, you know, feel free to, to reach out to myself, John Sullivan, um, and I've got my email address there. Um, we are uh, generally comprised of um, right now a, a general mailing list of um, Tollnet enthusiasts. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, I can um, add you to that list um, and kind of depending on your level of interest or um, which community or sort of stakeholder level you're in, um, we can try to find the right spot to, to connect you with, um, with Tolman. All right, question six. Can you discuss more about the requirements for the instrument small? For example, in our community, would your team provide tech assistance and data support? So I'll I'll uh, I'll start with this one and then maybe pass it over to Fernando for some of the technical um, comments. But uh, you know, last week you heard regarding the um, Pandora and Aeronet systems where they were um, when they were at an institution. Um, the networks provided the technical support and data support um, we we hope in the future to have uh, potentially some of these small lidars available and, and we expect to take the same approach as those other networks in um, having the same level of of support um, but fernando i don't think we wrote it but if you want to maybe just provide um, a little bit of simple con uh, technical context size and, and maybe plug size and things like that maybe folks might be interested yeah definitely so um yeah basically we we're trying to get um uh, lighter to be easy to operate generally speaking lighters are relatively complex instruments so we're trying to uh, do our best to make it uh, available for everybody um Basically, the instrument is, is relatively small. You saw it in the in the back of a pickup truck. It's about three feet by four feet by um, six feet, um, and we require about two two and a half to three kilowatts of power. Um, we can adapt to different voltages and frequencies and stuff like that. We we deploy these uh, small systems in Europe and. And so we use different voltages and, and frequencies. So we, we 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 can accommodate to all that. Um, our and, and we expect at some point to also um, be able to um, deploy these instruments in other places and 
and have uh, local partners that can take care of it. And so we're trying to um, make the instrument um, mm, reliable and, and 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 accommodate. Yeah, to to, to non lidar expert people can operate it too. Right. And yeah, I move to the next question. Question two. Uh, Okay. Question seven. With how much accuracy um, is the absorption cross sections or sigma calculated? Because this parameter is highly variable with ambient meteorological parameters. Yeah, so that's a, a good question. So um, this is um, generally the absorption, the also absorption cross section that we use for our retrieval. It's uh, measuring the lab. Um, by there is a huge spectroscopy community that does these type of measurements and they vary the temperature, pressure, stuff like that. Um, it's difficult to give um, uh, uh, one number, but generally speaking, let's say if you have a one percent accuracy in in our in your absorption cross section, uh, you're gonna have about one percent, uh, and so that that's gonna translate to about one percent. Um, um, random error in, in your in your ozone retrieval, right? Um, mm -hmm. But it's really dependent on on this is a ballpark number, right? It's really dependent on 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 the wavelength selection and many other parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay, question eight: What is the on and off wavelength difference in the compact ozone lidar? I can take that one too. Yeah, so we use uh, the main wavelengths that we use is 289 and 299. Um, that 289 is our on wavelength and 299 is our off wavelength. Uh, and we use also for um, for the boundary layer, we use uh, 266 and 289 um, because uh, 266 is more absorbed. So we get a better, um, less influenced by aerosols in the in the boundary layer where they are more abundant. So, uh, yeah, and you can use other wavelengths, 316, 3, 345, um, to, if you want to go higher, right? As you move away from the UV, you had, get, uh, you get less absorption. Uh, so basically, if you want to go higher, um, uh, you want to choose wavelengths, which are further uh, away from the UV, uh, into the visible, right? There's still UV, but, uh, further away from the deep UV. Um, and yeah, that's basically the answer, I guess. Okay. Question nine. Can this small be operated in a mobile format to understand tropospheric distributions across smaller geographic areas? For example, Western Lake Michigan shoreline, or are there limitations in the measurement principle that prevent this capability? Seems like an interesting use case for studies such as the Elmas or Lake Michigan ozone study in 2017. Yeah, I can take this one and then John can take over for the 10 one. Uh, so, um, yeah, definitely you can put the, them as close as you want. Um, and it's certainly, um, if you want to look at a very uh, spatial variability in small areas, uh, like shore, uh, like lakeshore studies and stuff like that, uh, you can do that. Um, if you put them really, really close, you have to make sure they don't uh, interfere with each other, but you can uh, certainly synchronize them uh, using an external timing source to make sure uh, the laser the laser of one of the instruments should uh, interleave with the other one. Uh, but yeah, for, for most applications where you're going to put them um, a few uh, miles away, that, that's no problem. You don't need to do any kind of synchronization. Um, the, the field of view of the lighters is, is very sm really small. So you, if you put them a mile away, uh, they are not going to interfere, right? Okay, question 10. How do you, this seems like an engineering type of question. How do you produce the off wavelength besides the principal wavelength of the laser in the dial? Or do you use separate lasers for the on and off wavelengths to get better accuracy? Yeah, I, I can take this one then. Um, so generally we are using um, wavelengths in the ultraviolet and the um, sort of existing or, or commercially available LIDARs or lasers rather, a lot of them that are being used, the, the fundamental wavelength is in the infrared. Um, so we 
take that and, and double it down into the green. And then we generally double that down again. So actually have quadrupled the principal wavelength uh, to in, in in most of these cases and including the, the small lighter down to 266 nanometers. Um, and we're using uh, primarily Raman cell technique, um, which is stimulated Raman scattering um, and um, to, to get those wavelengths. There are uh, different techniques that, that exist. Um, I said the, the SRS, the stimulated Raman scattering, um, optical parametric oscillators or OPOs, um, other types of, of tunable lasers. Um, the Raman cell technique that, um, that a lot of the Tonet lighters are using um, generally in, in the physical space is a, a cell that is pressurized with a certain Raman active gas inside the cell. As you transmit your laser beam, as you focus your laser beam into that cell, you you generate additional wavelengths. Um, and and this technique is, has long been discussed, um, and and is is quite available in the literature. And one advantage that I know I've taken I've taken advantage of of its capabilities because basically when you uh, take a, a lidar system or a tonal system that uses the Raman technique into the field. Right away, when you get into the field, you're going to know exactly which wavelengths are going to be generated from that laser. It doesn't matter the temperature uh, or the angle of anything. It um, it really is uh, fundamentally the the Raman scattering medium that you put in that Raman cell. It it uh, it drives that wavelength. So um, it's kind of been a nice compromise to um, reduce sort of an additional um, complexity of the lidar system that that we've used. So um, there are other ways to do it, but that that generally is, is how we found is the best compromise in, in getting the, the best data and, and, you know, getting measurements almost right away when we get to a field site. Great. Um, question 11. What is the type of relationship you observe between AOD and ozone optical depth? AOD being aerosol optical depth. Yeah, so I, I could take this one. So, uh, yeah, so generally you can have uh, one without the other, right? Um, you can have a um, lot of aerosols and no or, or very little ozone. You can have, let's say, dust plumes, and you, you might have very high AOD, but no particularly interesting ozone structures. Now, uh, where we generally measure, which is like urban environments where we are interested more in air quality studies, then you will generally observe uh, a correlation between the two. Um, you will see that when you have a uh, high AOD, you will have high ozone, uh, mostly like from local pollution sources, but also you can have um, smoke plumes on forest fires that generally also come together with uh, high ozone levels. And, and yeah, that's basically there is not necessarily a correlation, but when we where we measure generally, you will see a correlation, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Question twelve: Do you know of some toll net potential applications for sulfur dioxide monitoring? So, um, and and I wrote this response so. One thing that um, is is nice about ozone is is generally we have a uh, background concentration of ozone um, in anywhere between you know I, I said uh, roughly sixty parts per billion. Um, obviously, that can go much lower and much higher. But but the the point here here is that there's generally enough ozone in the atmosphere all the time that we get an absorption characteristic from the atmosphere on our on our ozone wavelengths back all the time. So um, sulfur dioxide being, um, at, at least where I am in the Eastern US, um, generally does not exceed uh, more than a few parts per billion. Uh, of course, if you were you know, right at a smokestack or, or right at a source, it can, it can be much higher, but I mean, really sort of in a well mixed free, um, convectively mixed boundary layer situation, you're not gonna get more than that. So so just the, the level of, um, of sulfur dioxide due to it being much smaller can just inherently provide a, a challenge to measurement. Um, we've had cases where uh, we have had um, LIDARs trying to measure um, SO2 coming directly from an incinerator or, or, or some major source. Um, 
so the combination of um, so so we do have tolerant lighters that could potentially be augmented to measure SO two, sort of in an experimental mode, but um, just with the the relative limitation of um, the the bulk concentration in the sulfur dioxide, and the fact that a lot of times um, those sources are so low to the ground that um, there are situations where the tolerant lidar might not be able to actually get down to that uh, vertical bin that the, the SO2 is actually comprised in um, to actually measure it. So, um, but, but like I said, there have been cases, um, I think I mentioned in this um, response that specific, you know, such as a, a volcanic eruption um, has certainly been ob uh, um, observed using, uh, if not tonet LIDAR, differential absorption LIDAR techniques to measure. Um, SO2 and things like that, but there might be just additional measurement um, techniques such as a, a balloon borne system that you might also want to be uh, complementing if you are interested in, in measuring SO2. Okay, question 13. How often do you observe the homogeneous or heterogeneous chemistry effects in your data? So I, I think the and I'll sort of answer this question more broadly, just describing, you know, ozone or ozone's characteristics. Um, a majority of the time we will see um, ozone in the morning hours. A lot of times if it is, if there's nocturnal mixing or nocturnal chemistry, a lot of times we'll say the word titration. Um, ozone levels can uh, drop. Uh, we, we see it quite uh, quite frequently in the Washington DC area below you know five or ten parts per billion at night um, and then during the afternoon hours uh, when things are more well conductively mixed um, that ozone is is much more um, homogeneous uh, in, in particular homogeneous within the boundary layer so uh, and then once again in the evening hours um, we'll have um, a lot of times vertical layers that remain after the boundary layer begins to collapse. So there's sort of the heterogeneity, um, and I'm not sure if they were describing this. I, I'm sort of answering this in, in terms of vertical homogeneity or vertical heterogeneity, um, but the same can al also be said about the spatial um, extent of this, just from what we see with um, some of the surface monitors in our area where when we're in the field with, with Tolmet data. Uh, it's it's, it's um, frequently when there's a well-mixed uh, boundary layer in the, you know, like I said, oftentimes um, afternoon time period, if we see that vertically well mixed in our LIDAR data, um, a lot of times it will match what the surface monitors in that location are seeing, just giving us some additional confidence that, um, you know, that we are understanding the, uh, the processes going on in the atmosphere during that time. And question 14 seems to be a bit related, asking about ozone production. Um, it says in slide 25, you mentioned the term afternoon ozone buildup. Could you elaborate on that process and local sources? Yeah, of course. So um, what we are deploying these tolmet ladders for is to really understand um, the, the boundary layer ozone enhancements. So I, I think I mentioned in, in some of the introduction slides, um, we are generally pairing, um, when we're deploying Tolnet LIDARs, at least in the last few years, we've tried to um, support these field projects by bringing in multiple Tolnet LIDARs. What that allows us to do is um, to potentially be measuring the atmosphere uh, upwind and maybe within and then downwind of a major metropolitan area. Um, someone mentioned the Lake Michigan ozone study already in, in one of these questions. You saw the New York and the uh, California data from last summer uh, during this presentation. So um, we can provide a lot of context at these Tolmet sites. I sort of think of them as these super sites. They're, they're generally um, co-located with a lot of additional either profiling measurements or surface measurements. Um, so you got these super sites that are um, very heavily instrumented. Um, and then uh, a lot of times we'll have the ability to have an aircraft that might have some in situ payload um, on the aircraft that can be flying between these Tolmet sites sort of as an anchor point to measure the, um, you know, in situ chemistry going on. And they can measure a lot more about the ozone and, and precursors on, on some of these aircraft. Um, and then tying that all together 
um, really getting, I think, maybe to, to the question here on on this is is using um, some of the chemical transport models, uh, either the the reanalysis or the forecast, depending on if we're in sort of field mode or or post analysis mode, um, to really tie um, all the measurements together and, and put them in context for potentially looking at um, source apportionment or um, ozone chemical transport um, and understanding where that ozone. Uh, has come from. Um, there's obviously photochemical ozone production in, in major metropolitan areas. Um, Tolmet also is able to measure ozone that might be coming from long range transport sources. So we can measure the ozone, but kind of determining where it comes from does take a little bit of, of careful analysis. And that's why um, I always want to just mention if you are looking at um, some of the ozone LIDAR data, uh, feel free to reach out to the um, the, the PI that, that took that data for some additional context, they might have some field notes or additional um, ideas on uh, where to go for your analysis efforts. Thank you. And question 15, are you using any Raman cell technique for producing the off wavelength in your dial? I think you spoke to this uh, a little bit earlier. Yes, yes. So we we do use a uh, Raman cell technique to generate some of our light. Do some other uh, use other techniques. Um, in the case of, uh, for example, the this small mobile ozone lighter, uh, we do use uh, Raman cells. And uh, depending on which gases you use, you can generate different sets of uh, wavelengths. Uh, most common gases are hydrogen, uh, deuterium, and carbon dioxide. Uh, but yeah, there are many, there are other, other, other ones that can be used, but yeah, um, yeah, that's, we, we do use it and it's a common, uh, way of generating the wavelengths for dial. Mm. And question 16, the measurements of wind speed and direction are vital to determine the nocturnal enhancement of ozone. Um, are they available in Tolnet? So that this is a, um. A really good point. So I, I want to thank uh, uh, whoever was able to, to to submit this question. Sort of understanding the um, kind of the union of the profiling of of chemical you know, trace gas species or, or aerosols um, and and wind. So you're sort of understanding in um, by having these co-located uh, both the chemistry and the dynamics at, at one time, and um, really getting a sort of a novel understanding of the atmosphere when you've got these. Um, co-located together. So um, Tolnet itself does not measure winds. Um, there's uh, generally the, the techniques used to measure winds um, are a little bit of a different of a laser system. Um, it's generally a Doppler uh, shifted technique to understand that. So um, it, it it's not as simple uh, of, a, of a measure. No, I shouldn't say as simple, but um, it's, it's not where we could add an extra channel for winds. There are some complexities. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I'm I'm uh, at Goddard today, and we're having a little bit of internet connectivity issues. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I just wanted to make the point that Tolnet uh, physically does not measure winds. However, we uh, typically really try to co-locate these measurements with existing wind profiler measurements to add to um, the the ability to really enhance the the analysis between the chemistry and the dynamics. Okay. Um, question 17, are there any toll net over India? And I think you spoke to this uh, currently only toll net uh, network is available over the US. Yes, so and, and we uh, did some uh, deployments uh, to Europe. I think that's the only other place besides North America. Um, but yeah, certainly in the future, we don't know, we, we are open to Every, any kind of collaboration, so you can reach out to John if you have a, a good plan for uh, measurement somewhere else, and, and we can discuss. Uh, right, so yeah, we never know. Okay, question eighteen: Are you using the path averaged approach besides the range result approach to measure the ozone time series for trends and variability analyses? I'll, I'll take this one and I'll just 
say one quick go back. We've also had uh, Tolnet data from Korea uh, during the uh, Chorus AQ campaign in, in 2016. Um, so, and we'd love to work with, with other countries. Um, we'd have to find the right funding model to make it work. Um, but uh, we, would, we would certainly love to hear any ideas. Um, so I wanted to just mention what I think this question was, was getting at, um, understanding ozone time series and transfer variability analyses. Um, a lot of the Tonet LIDARs, um, probably three quarters of them at this point, have been only measuring dur during sort of campaign modes, or if they were in their home institution, they might have only been there for a few months during that year, um, and then went out to a different site. Um, so, because the Tonet data, um, we, we're, we're producing a lot more data now. We're, we've really, um, since COVID, I think collectively have put a lot more effort um, and, and energy towards making these measurements uh, autonomous or nearly autonomous. You've seen a lot of the, the, the curtain time series already uh, in this presentation. We're collecting a lot more data. Um, but I think to, to truly, uh, at this point, use that data for um, you know, a specific time series or trend or, or variability analyses might be be kind of challenging. I, I think if you had some other data sets um, that you were pulling trends from, there's a there's a lot of other networks for um, long term trends. I'll I'll give a plug for the NDAC network detection of atmospheric composition change, um, and the TOR tropospheric ozone assessment report are both uh, great resources for understanding ozone trends. Um, and and if you had uh, already done some Trend analysis and maybe wanted to pull in uh, a year of Tolmet data at a certain site or multiple years to maybe augment that analysis. I think that would be fine, but um, I would be hesitant uh, for most of the Tolmet lidars to to really pull in um, a, a specific quantifiable uh, trend analysis. Yeah, and and after today's Q and A, maybe we can add links to those to the resources that you mentioned yep. and deck in the tour. I agree. Um, Okay. Um, is it possible? Question 19. Is it possible to examine the effect of greenhouse gases on ozone using the LIDAR data? Um, yeah, I, I can go very briefly over this one. Uh, so it's, it certainly depends, right? Uh, like every, every other question. Um, um, we, we, our LIDAR generally doesn't measure any other greenhouse gas. It's for, for example, we don't measure CO2, methane, or anything else. So it, it will be hard. You will need to, you know, Put this together with other data sets and, and look at what um at this interaction right um and it will be dependent on the on the type of greenhouse gas uh, that you have right um yeah and i don't know if john if wants to add anything uh to this okay we can move on to question 20. Um, in the graph of ozone from the LIDAR, why are there some dates and times which appear empty? I, I just uh, wanted to, to mention that right now, Tolmet is not a 24-7 a measurement. Um, I, I think we've maybe glossed over the, the challenges of, of just using active sensing measurements in general. Um, we've really tried to, to make a lot of measurements, um, but there are just practical considerations for operating LIDARs or lasers rather 24 seven, especially in a field measurement. So um, those are, are simply just either data gaps due to instrument issues or you know, not having an operator present. Uh, a lot of times with some of these larger uh, Tolmet systems were required by uh, our specific NASA um, agencies or um, the, the FAA for, for laser operators to uh, to run them 24 or to, to have an operator for when they're being operated. Um, this is sort of a, I'll, I'll take this to, to comment on um, why we've been putting so much emphasis and, and uh, effort towards the small sort of compact ozone lidars with the design that um, would hopefully make these measurements a little bit more continuous without having some of these, these same challenges. Um, I'm not going to say there's no challenges, but um, hopefully mitigating them um, and finding a, a way forward where they can be a, a really uh, or as close to 24-7 style measurement as, as we can. And I think, um, uh, Fernando, if you wanted to comment on on uh, any of that, feel free to. Otherwise, I'll let you uh, take the next one. 
Oh, no, I have nothing to add really. Um, yeah, but yeah, for sure. We, we're trying to get as close as possible to 24 seven, but it's challenging and, and, but we're getting there. So, yeah. Okay. Question 21. Are any of these networks located at the same sites as EPA or state operated air quality sites so that we can evaluate the vertical profile in addition to the surface level ozone concentration? Um, yeah, so some of the stations um, are close to EPA or state operated AQ sites um, because we, so Tolnet operates in these two modes, right? Where we have generally when the instruments are not deployed in a field campaign, they sit at their uh, base uh, where, uh, you know, the, the, the institution that built the, the instrument uh, operates. In our case, in my case, for example, we had Table Mountain facility, which is basically a remote site where near LA, but we don't have an EPA. Uh, station nearby. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we deployed several times to the LA area near uh, EPA stations or um, other uh, California uh, LQ sites. Uh, and we recently took a couple of uh, these small lighters to Utah for um, a campaign uh, where we had them. Um, the, the instruments were deployed at the uh, sites from the Utah Division of Air Quality. Uh, and we had a, a, a ton of additional instruments, uh, airplanes, and this was a cooperation between NASA and NOAA. And so we, 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 we do that and we try to, when we deploy, we, we, when we look for a place to deploy our instruments, we generally want to have additional information to get a better picture. So we, we really look um, to, to deploy at EPA sites or other AQ sites uh, already existing there. Okay, hey, question 22. Can we get the spectral effective beam absorbance, transmittance, or scattering within the boundary layer, especially less than, uh, especially below 300 meters? Yeah, I, I, I uh, responded to this one. Um, and I, I, I think what maybe the, the, question was was getting at was just understanding how uh, how low into the atmosphere or how close to the surface Tolmet may be able to, to probe uh, or to profile. Um, and uh, there's actually, a, I think, a question later on um, on asking about this. So the, uh, the the practical limitations of the LIDAR systems in general are how um, closely uh, that beam is able to transmit, and then um, how much of that beam is is effectively mapped uh, or imaged by the telescope. Um, so there is some physical, uh, there's always some physical distance between the laser, uh, when the laser exits the app, uh, the trailer and where your telescope is located. Um, and you can Sort of overcome this with maybe some wider field field of view or some uh, reduction in divergence of the beam, um, but but all of these various uh, sort of engineering constraints uh, do sort of limit the um, the uh, the profiling of, of of ozone lidar at the surface. Um, we are generally, I would say, across the network, able to produce reliable data around the hundred meter above the, the surface mark. Um, in certain cases, I, I think we are able to get much lower. Um, I also want to plug that there is a NOAA uh, uh, chemical sciences lab uh, Tolnet system that has a scanner uh, on top of its trailer where it actually scans at multiple angles along the horizon. Um, and they're actually able to get um, ozone LIDAR at the, the surface. Um, so they are uh, really doing an additional um, engineering uh, effort, uh, in it, you know, besides the other Tolnet sites to to get this um, this level of of detail of ozone uh, at the surface level. And in fact, when they were they were parked in a field project, um, I believe uh, in a mountain range near um, Las Vegas in Clark County, Nevada, and we're actually able to point the laser beam down to actually get ozone below the trailer, um, which is kind of interesting uh, to think about when you're trying to look at ozone transport within a city and, and without of a city. 
Okay, question 23. Would you mind please explaining the absorption by wavelength and how it is interpreted? Um, yeah, I can take this one. Uh, so basically, dial, as, as John explained in the presentation, uh, works uh, basically by transmitting like two wavelengths, right? Uh, one that is more absorbed and one that is less absorbed by uh, the species that we want to measure, in this case, uh, ozone. Um, so um, base, uh, looking at, so we transmit these two wavelengths, right? And they get absorbed as they get transmitted through through the atmosphere. And so we can look at how much one signal gets absorbed with respect to the other, and we can calculate based on this slope difference how much ozone is in the atmosphere. Um, that's the basic, uh, you know, explanation of how um, um, the dial works, and and we might just add uh, in the end uh, maybe a picture here to to show uh, what we when we are talking about signals and and how this slope thing works. Uh, it might be easier to explain with a picture, uh, but yeah, that's the basic uh, operation. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Question 24, do we have an option for other LIDAR observations to be involved with Tollnet? So I will say um, within uh, Tollnet, we are primary, I mean, we're consisting exclusively of ozone LIDAR measurements. Um, that's a little bit uh, based on sort of our mandate and how we handle the data and a lot of our archiving and formats and just a little bit of technical aspect to that. So um, if there are other uh, ozone lighter observations that um, someone in the community is taking and they would like to be uh, paired uh, with, with Tolmet or are interested in becoming a, a member, um, that's certainly something I think that we could make happen. I think our, our program managers would, would be really excited about. Um, but if it's other LIDAR observations um, of other species or aerosols, um, it might not be as easy to kind of plug into Tolmet, but I'm, I'm just generally curious um, if it's uh, other atmospheric LIDAR observations. Um, if, if you're talking more along, along the lines of LIDAR altimetry or um, or things like that, that's probably not the best uh, option for, for observations. Um, there's, a, there's a few other networks that are looking at um, more of, of these kind of uh, altitude or altimetry type measurements that would probably be more useful for, for both you and us to, to have those uh, measurements resource there. Okay, question 25. Is it possible, this is about additional trace gases, is it possible to use the Tollnet data to measure other trace gases such as CO2 um, and formaldehyde? Um, I could take this one. So the CO2, um, it, it's more, um, it's really far from uh, the wavelength region that Tollnet generally operates. Um, there are certainly lighters that measure CO2, but it's not really in the uh, Tollnet's uh, wheelhouse. Um, uh, formaldehyde is closer. It's around the 300 to 350, I think, absorption. Uh, there you have the issue of interference, right? Because it starts to overlap with ozone and ozone has a stronger absorption. So you start, you, you need um, to look at the, uh, these absorption bounds are narrower for formaldehyde. You can certainly think uh, that eventually told it could look at that, but uh, yeah, it's not. I think in the near term plan uh, to to go for those species, uh, but eventually, why not, right? And question twenty six: um, the spatial. What is the spatial coverage of Tollnet, including campaign observations? Yeah, I, I think I uh, sort of hit on this a little bit in in one of the previous yeah. questions, um, where we are. Um, you know, simply, you know, we're measuring uh, ozone at a specific, you know, you may think of it as a super site or a waypoint for uh, for satellite or aircraft observations. Um, so we are really just measuring the ozone at those specific sites. And we're measuring that vertically above the, the LIDAR. Um, so we really have an, a, a lot of additional um, understanding of the atmosphere at those specific points, but, but tying in um, additional satellite and model um, 
uh, and, and surface measurements to kind of understand these processes further, it, it really takes um, a lot of additional uh, measurements and 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 uh, and other you know things to kind of place the full context of you know if you really wanted to understand an air quality event. Um, and so I think really um, kind of getting at the the part that Tolmet I think plays a key role in is really understanding that vertical variability. Um, and if there is, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, the transport, the long range transport of a pollutant, you know, for instance, ozone uh, into the region, um, your surface monitors are not going to pick that up. Um, the chemical transport models, unless they had that long range transport identified in their model um, there, it's not going to be simulated. So, you know, it's just a, a case where having the actual uh, LIDAR measurements the vertical measurements of ozone uh, can really add to the context and the, and the understanding um, of uh, of some of these chemical measurements. Okay, I see question 27 has to do about Pandora. Um, please don't apologize. We don't have any folks from the Pandora team on the Q&A today, but we'll um, make sure that they see this question. Um, and we have time for maybe one or two additional questions. Um, can you scroll down to question 34? I think that that's a relevant question. Can satellite measurements measure tropospheric ozone and how accurate is it compared to Tolnet? So the, um, I, I mentioned in the slides earlier and, and we can also add that figure again um, if you think about the atmosphere, generally, the kind of the vertical profile of ozone, you've got about 90% of your ozone in the stratosphere. Um, so that is really, an, and we're talking about that in terms of parts per million. Um, whereas in the, the uh, tropospheric ozone, or if we want to think about it as the boundary layer ozone, or, or really what, what Tolman is measuring, we're talking about parts per billion, um, so a thousand times less. Um, so there is a real challenge in, in satellite measurements to just due to the, the physics of um, the way the you know, sunlight is, is radiated back to the satellite sensors. It, it's quite challenging to actually probe through that stratospheric ozone layer and get into the troposphere. Um, recently, there is a, um, I mentioned, I, I said it was the satellite tempo. It's actually the instrument tempo um, on um, the uh, Intel Sat 40E wet, uh, uh, satellite um, is uh, working on measuring ozone, tropospheric ozone from space. Um, I, I believe that um, in their current configuration, the, the best they might be able to do is, is really measure a tropospheric ozone column. Um, so maybe the entire troposphere or maybe two points of information in that troposphere um, for data. So uh, there really um, isn't a satellite that is able to measure what we would consider sort of ozone profiles from space the way Tolnet does. Um, so we are uh, currently working on some of these uh, Tolnet measurements to basically provide context for um, either evaluating the models that might go into the a priori for the uh, eventual satellites that might measure these tropospheric columns. Uh, or degrading some of the Tolnet data and the measurements to then evaluate those um, ozone measurements as they come online. Um, so there isn't really a uh, a one to one in terms of um, you know Tolnet measurements validating the satellite quite yet, um, but we're hoping and maybe by the next time we give this seminar, um, we'll actually be able to show some results as compared to. Um, uh, tempo or, or another um, geostationary uh, air quality satellite. Great. And with just about two minutes left, I think that will wrap it up for today. If we didn't get to your question, we'll answer it in written form and we'll post it um, on the website on the training page within about a, a week of today's uh, presentation. Um, thank you so much to John and Fernando, our guest presenters and contributors today. Um, anything, I'll open it up to you both uh, for any final words. No, I, I'll just say thanks to uh, thanks to everyone. Um, Tolnet as a whole is uh, 
probably the youngest network you will hear from during this uh, five part RSET training series. So we um, are always looking forward to getting any feedback on um, on anything in the net in the network or in the data that you're interested in. Um, and we're trying to to grow and expand as much as we can and, and hopefully we can um, kind of grow and expand as the community is, is interested in the data. So thanks for attending. Fernando. Yeah, thanks everybody for attending and yeah, we're looking forward to to expand our our network and cooperation and feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have any other questions. Thank you both again, and we hope that you all will join us for part 5, the final session in this 5 part training series on Thursday, August 22nd. Have a good rest of your day everyone.